Hello and welcome to the Practical Animal Channel. Do you want to work with animals? If you want to know what it takes to get into the animal industry, get results and improve your performance when working with animals, then this channel is for you. Domestic animals or wild, wild animals in the wild or in captivity, I cover all sectors of the industry. Most weeks, I interview an animal industry professional who provides insight into how they became successful working with animals. Today's guest is Dr. David Glynn Fox, who is an eagle expert. David has written books and numerous articles on, amongst other subjects, eagle falconry, and he is a former lecturer. He joins us today to talk about his life and work lecturing in the biological sciences, animal behaviour, imaging, photography and golden eagles. He joins us now. Dr. David Glynn Fox, welcome to the Practical Animal Channel. Thank you very much. David, first of all, can you start by telling us this must be star. This is indeed Star. Yes, he's a, a male golden eagle who was bred by a friend of mine in North Yorkshire. He's not of the, uh, the nominate race that we find in this country. He's, uh, he's from Kazakhstan. His parents are first generation bred from Kazakhstan. I got him when he was 14 weeks old. He's now 14 years old. I've been flying him ever since. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, David, um... If somebody is a falconer and perhaps they're at novice level, you know, starting off with a red tailed hawk or a Harris's hawk, is it possible to suggest a logical sequence that a, such a falconer can follow to where they reach the dizzy heights of enough experience to take on a golden eagle, please? Yes, the two species you've mentioned, the Harris hawk and the, the red tailed hawk, are both excellent hawks for falconry purposes. You, I've often heard people say that um, a golden eagle is just, well, it's just another big Harris hawk. That is a massive mistake to make. Uh, not only are they much, much bigger, but they're extremely powerful birds and they can do you a lot of damage in a short space of time. But so, unless you have the right mindset, and that might sound like a bit pretentious, but unless you have the right mindset, I would strongly recommend leaving eagles well alone. Well, that's fascinating. Uh, I mean, is it possible for you to suggest what that mindset might be? Yes, you've got to really love eagles in the first place. You've got to really want to fly them, not just think, oh, that looks a nice, great, but I'd like to walk around the streets with that. Completely the wrong attitude. You know, sooner or later, it will beat you up and you'll wish you'd never bought the bird in the first place. And it will be passed on, which again, as far as I'm concerned, it's not good for, for the eagle. Uh, it's, it's bad for animal welfare, which is a, a strong point of mine. And it gets falconry a bad name too. That's interesting. Thank you. Um, David, please can you describe your career from the start until, your, until you retired? Well, from the start of my career, I left school with absolutely no qualifications whatsoever. Uh, most of my teachers said I would never amount to anything. And I wish they were alive today so I could show them a few things. But um, so I went into a factory like most uh, working class people did in those days. Um, and then I was offered a job at Council Research Department, not a university, working with animals in the laboratory. Uh, and I got that completely on the strength, oops, completely on the strength of my natural history knowledge. Give me just tiny for a minute. And um, which surprised me no end because I got no university background whatsoever, which was a great shame for me. Um, and I, I didn't have a chance to get into university at, that, at the at young level because most of my friends who left before me suggested most strongly that if I, if I wanted to have a good time, don't pass your 11 plus so you don't have to go to grammar school and work on. What do you know at 11? So I deliberately failed my 11 plus and I've regretted that ever since. So, so from there, uh, once I got to cancer research, I was doing work with, with animal research with, into animals with, with cancer. Uh, I was there for about 21 years. And then after that, uh, a position came up in the Department of Life Sciences, which was then called zoology. 
Um, so I thought, well, I'll have a go at that and, and take that. And that was much better because I was working with animal behaviour. I was lecturing to students and, and that was much more, more of my life. And then from, from there, from there, I started leading field trips. I joined the uh, School of Biological Sciences MSc photography course, teaching students natural history photography, which most of our schools have nothing to do with natural history at all, which to me has always been a, a, a great omission. Um, and so I started leading field trips out to places like Bempton Cliffs in Yorkshire, uh, down to um, Peter Scott's place at Slimbridge, uh, Lathkill, the and Dobbs, all over the place, all different, different field trips, and um, lecturing to the students, not just how to take photographs, but also to um, appreciate the species they were taking. Um, and to, to make sure that they make sure the animal welfare in the wild was not compromised. And so after that, um, while still doing that job, actually, I was asked to take over the natural history collections at, well, at um, Nottingham University. And they'd been neglected for a great many years. They'd been stuck in, in um, rooms and not used. And the general consensus of opinion amongst academics was, well, it's all Victorian stuff. We don't need that anymore. How wrong can you be? And I'll give you a couple of examples. I was lecturing some BSc students. These are Bachelor of Science students in their third year. And I brought out a narwhal tusk and handed it around. Can anybody tell me what this narwhal, what this tusk is? And they looked around and said, three of them actually said, is it from a dragon? I'm sorry, is it from a, a unicorn? You know, a unicorn. I said, close, no, it's from a dragon. You know, BSc student, third year, wait, waited to go for an MSc, still believe in unicorns and dragons. I could not believe it. You know, so. Um, and then I got um, a stuffed platypus out. But before I got it out, I said, anybody know how big a platypus is? And they were scratching their heads. Nobody had ever seen one, of course. So when I brought it out, they were surprised. They thought it was as big as a retriever. They'd seen the advert on TV, thinking it was as big as a golden retriever or a Labrador. But of course, it's much, much smaller. And that was my whole point. You can show all sorts of animals on a TV screen or, or computer monitor, but an African elephant looks the same size as a horsefly. Specimens in your hand are a completely different ballgame. You get a feel for the thing. So I get very irate when I hear people say museums are things of the past. No, they're not. They're amongst the best teaching aids we've got. And I strongly support all the natural history museums on that front alone. And basically, that's my, I mean, that's in a, in a, in a nutshell, but that's what I've been doing. That's amazing. that's amazing. Thanks, David. That, that's really interesting. Which brings me on to my next question, which is what skills and personal qualities did you need to take on the roles that you did, including oh. latterly as a lecturer at the MSc level in biological imaging and photography, as well as curating the natural history collections at Nottingham University? It was basically all, all down to my natural history knowledge. People, I mean, uh, I'm quite astounded by that really because I've been no qualifications. But it's very, very difficult to get somebody who knows anything about natural history on the broad spectrum of the subject uh, to teach anything like that. And so I, I put lectures together and, and did a, a test one in the main laboratory, in the main theatre at the University of Nottingham. And all the zoology academics came to it, all the students attended it. And afterwards, the head of the department came to me and said, you know, David, there's nobody in this department could have done that. You know, and from there, things rocketed, you know, and all because I've been studying on my own back natural history ever since I was a child. And I got this interest basically from my father to start with. He, was, he used to collect butterflies. And um, I found his collection when I was two years old and somehow removed the lid, took the specimens out and took them outside and played air, airplanes with them. And I broke a wing off, oh, we're going to get another one. You know, and I more or less destroyed his collection like that. Uh, and I don't know um, what was actually said. It was probably about principle. But to try and make up for it when I was about four, I got his throw hook, butterfly hooks, and cut the pictures out and stuck the images into a cardboard box. I still don't know what the outcome of that was, but I'm surprised I wasn't buried under a gooseberry bush in the back garden. But ever since then, I've been interested in natural history all my life. It's the, the, the one driving force I've always had. As I, as I said earlier, they do not teach it in schools, or most schools, I, I, all the schools I went to, you, know, you, wanted, you wanted to play football or, or things, or learn algebra. I mean, how many people use algebra, to be honest, you know? 
unless you're uh, sort of physician or um, astrophysics or something like that, most people don't use it. You spend weeks and weeks and weeks studying all this pi r squared stuff that nobody, hardly anybody, ever uses. So I so said, why can't we have some natural history? But then I realized, who's going to teach it? And that's the key, who is going to teach it? Do you think that the, the general skills of being a field naturalist, which you are, which I am, do you think those skills are on the decline? Very much so, yes. Despite all the, all the uh, hype about uh, climate change and, and all this sort of thing, I've, I've done a lot of work on this. I put a couple of lectures together on this, and I found out that 95% of the human population isn't the slightest bit interested in natural history. And you haven't got to go very far to see this. Go to, I'm not calling India, but go to India or any of the third world countries and ask uh, about their interest in, in nature. They know nothing about it. They're not bothered at all. And it's pretty much the same here. You, you, I mean, I, everybody I speak to is, is a naturalist because they're the people I circulate with. But when I give talks sometimes, I get some of the most mundane questions that think the average man in the street really should know this, but they don't. And so if you're not interested, you're not going to do anything about it. And that is a great shame. David, why do you think that interest in natural history, natural historians' skills are on the wane? Um, basically, because we all live in, in, in suburbs now, or, or in uh, mass, mass urban uh, conurbations where they don't see these things. You know, you've only got to go on the natural history channels on, on Facebook to so those common insects and things that everybody, you think everybody would know. Uh, what is this? They haven't got a clue. And that's because they don't see it unless it drops in their beer. Literally, you know, they don't, don't understand it. But if you're not interested, why would you? Um, living in a, in a massive conurbation, you're not going to see it because it, it doesn't occur there. How would you describe, David, the profession of lecturing in the animal sciences today? I call it the animal sciences. I'm, I'm generalizing massively. You know, your yeah. background was in uh, biological imaging and photography, but um, I'm calling it the animal sciences. How would you describe that today? Well, it's not the way I would like to see it go. And there are reasons for that, but mostly it's to do it's at the molecular level where they're looking at DNA genetics and this sort of thing, which I speak to a lot of students all the time and they hate it. You know, they really hate doing it. And when they used to come to university for, um, uh, see if they could get to a position at Nottingham, they took them into my studio, which was basically a natural history museum, and they loved it. And they signed up for it, and that's the last time they saw it. They never saw it again, because it was all, all test tube stuff. Oh. And that's why we don't get the naturalists that they are today. Shame, really. um, how would you see the profession of lecturing in the animal sciences, in animal behaviour, in biological imaging and photography? How would you describe it progressing over the next 20 years? I think it should progress well. There, there are enough people, knowledgeable people teaching it. Um, it's a difficult question to answer, really, because it's like when you see yourself in 10 years time, I don't really know. But I think it's going to be increasingly molecular and, and less whole, whole animal, if you like, less whole bodied animal. That's what I've witnessed so far, and I've not seen any change in that. And as we're getting more into things like COVID and various diseases which affect mankind, the research is going down that road rather than plain natural history. And that's the way I see it going more and more. It's an allied question, but relevant. How do you see uh, skills in natural history developing over 20 They're not developing. And this is why I, I try to push it in schools. That's why I take STAR out to, to schools. And, and I, I used to set up exhibitions, which you know, all sorts of various animals from the collections to get people interested. But it's an uphill struggle job because they're not really that interested because they don't see it. Yeah, the, the thing, an eagle's fantastic, it's great. But when you've gone home, give it a week's time and they've more or less forgotten about it. They don't really know. And that, that's a worry, really. But if we taught it at lower, lower levels, when, when you first start school, like you had a nature table with all sorts of things on, and somebody who knew what they were talking about, which is you know, absolutely necessary, then there's no way of fostering it onto younger people. 
what advice would you give someone, David, on wanting to become a lecturer in the animal sciences? You, you, need, the, you need the backup, the, the, sort of the, uh, the biological and zoological knowledge. You need to work hard through university to get on a professional level. You really do. Without that, the competition is so fierce today, John, that it, you, you really are having, having a problem with it. It's not, not impossible, but you, you can do it. And some, some friends of mine or stu ex-students have gone on to do great things. They work with the BBC. They, they, they form their own film units. They're all over the world uh, photographing and filming all sorts of, of animals and, and plants and things. And they've made a, a, a fantastic career out of it and all, all credit to them. That wasn't available when I was at school. Uh, David, what three books have most influenced your thinking? Nothing to do with academic science. I, I can show you some. Um, this is what I've had since I was a child. T.A. Coward's Birds of the British Isles. And I, I, it's three volumes. And I read these from cover to cover, heaven knows how many times. So that got me knowledgeable on, on birds of Britain, specifically. But then I mentioned earlier about cutting up um, Frederick William Froholt's books that my father owned. Well, this is what I've had to buy at great expense since. Um, the British Butterflies. I've got all his books now, but I could have had them free um, from my father. But me being ha handy with scissors all those years back, sort of put pay to that. And then when I was um, beginning my teens, I started getting interested in falconry. None of our family's ever done this, so I don't know where it came from. So I bought this. Uh, but a manual of falconry. You might, if you've seen the film Kez, you might remember this is the one that uh, Billy Casper stole from the library in Bradford. Um, he, didn't, he didn't actually see it in real life, of course, but uh, I bought this and um, it was my Bible for quite a long time. I now have a, a library of over, or must be over, at least 500 books on falconry and birds of prey. Uh, or if you count the natural history ones as well, and I've got an entire room full of those. Because you can't keep it all up there, you know, you, you forget things as, as you get older and you cram more in the brain and more falls out the other side. Um, but it, it's, it, it's my passion and I, I love it and uh, I never wanted to stop doing it. So they were really my three ones that got me going and got, got my interest going. But I was fortunate because, um, in fact, I took my wife to where I lived only yesterday and showed her how it's changed because I lived in a place called Beach Avenue at Mapley, Nottingham. And from this hill, which we lived on, you could see for miles and miles, 10, 15 miles, and there were all wildflower meadows, woodland streams, all this sort of thing. Uh, for a young developing naturalist, that was incredible. You know, you couldn't, um, you couldn't improve on that at all. Uh, and that's where I learned my field craft, chasing everything on six or more legs. To go back to star for a moment, I mean, yes. if you're a person with that fascination for golden eagles, is that enough to get into eagle falconry? Yes, because you, um, th this is something I argued about originally when we brought out the legislation. Um, we, what, what they did, which I think was wrong, and I've lamented it since, they licensed the birds. I believe they should have licensed the falconers. That would have made more sense because you can't stop somebody going and buying a bird but it, it, um, today because it's not a falcon that's licensed. So they can. You can you know, a 10 year old could go and buy one of these, literally, you know, which of course is wrong. But if you license the falcon like they do in America, you have to go through a course, which means that once you've, you've attained that course, and you can't have a bird until you have, at least everybody knows you've attained a certain level uh, of accomplishment in, in this field. And that to me is vital. It was a, um, a, certainly an opportunity lost as far as I'm concerned. And we're paying for it now because there, there are people today who are buying Harris Hawks and they lose them, you know, through their own incompetence. I think, well, it's only cost me 150 pounds, I'll go and get another. Which means this poor bird's flying all around the neighborhood. You know, it's, it's, it's a nightmare. And we, I don't know how we can stop it. Had that falcon been licensed, he wouldn't have done that. Do you, you know, see it happening, people. licensing? It's the wrong people getting in, you see, John, this is it. Um, when I first started falconry, there was only one club, which was the British Falcons Club excellent uh, organization it still runs today i have a member of it uh, full, full member of it today but then it was a very close shop there was only a handful of falcons in this country they didn't want anybody else getting involved with it. it's very much different now but in those days and I, I i decried it quite a lot because nobody was more keen than i was 
so I had to learn the hard way through trial and error. So uh, you can't take birds of prey from the wild in this country. It's been illegal since 1954. So I got all my birds of prey from abroad. I imported them. And we had all sorts of uh, strange, weird things come in because I might have ordered what, uh, uh, 10 black Shaheens, which is a type of peregrine for club members, uh, which a club I formed later called the East Midlands Hawking Club. But the dealers uh, in India and elsewhere, where we got them from, thought we wanted to eat them. So they put any old thing in. So you might get three black cats, two crested serpent eagles, which nobody wanted. You know, you, you were stuck with these things. So it was a nightmare sometimes, you know. Fascinating. David, yeah. what's your most treasured possession in your hawking bag? Ah, there are two. I've just got to reach behind the laptop for a second. There are two. Although he's wearing one, I could use this one. Well. The first one is, well, the, the first one really is the whistle. This hangs around your neck, and you blow it. And that is a Pavlovian reflex, which uh, it means the sound of food is presented with the sound of the whistle. So if he flies half a mile away out of sight, the whistle will bring him back. Hopefully, it has done so far. Um, and that's the one. And the other, of course, is the hood. Um, there are many, many different types. Some of them have got beautiful feathers. I've got loads of them on the wall in the living room. Um, but this has many, many uses. And first and foremost, it's to stop stress on the bird. If I took that hood off now, having been stood for a year, it'd be crashing all over, all over the house, you know. So it keeps him calm. But if you're walking out in the field um, you, um, and you've, you've, you've trained him to the point where you see most things, but he's not seeing somebody come by. Um, on a horse, for example, or a tractor, I can see that and, and forestall a stressful moment by popping the hood straight up. What they don't see doesn't bother them. I can fire a 12 bore shotgun with his hand. He might flinch slightly, but it wouldn't bother him. I had an Imperial Eagle, which if I just raised the gun up, he would be off. He didn't like sticks. You know, so you get to learn the, uh, each bird, and this is extremely important, you learn to read it. You can see when it's starting to get stressed. And this is what takes experience. You know, you've got to, been in quite a while before it really clicks. How and if, if they're ill, you know, you need to be able to know when they're not well and that they show signs. Sometimes they'll stand just on two feet all day. Their eyes will go over, they'll, they'll fluff a feather out, they look lack, lack, lack lustre. And so you need to recognize that. Sometimes it's nothing, but you just need to keep an eye on it just to be sure. And so you need to have a good vet. And John Cooper is an excellent vet. When I was 14, I sent him a, a kestrel that had died under, under odd circumstances. It shouldn't have died. I sent it to him. By, uh, John then was um, a student learning, doing his, his thesis. Um, but he did a, put an advert asking for bodies of birds of prey. So I passed it up and sent it off to him. The post mortem, unfortunately, didn't reveal much, some changes in the liver. But vets like that, and when I first started, were non existent, were extremely rare. Neil Forbes is another good one. Uh, Richard Clark of the BFC. There's quite a few good ones now, but when I started doing it, there weren't. I had a Lana falcon, which comes from Africa, and I took it to the vet because I wasn't happy. Its, it's breathing was, was laboured, and it, you could hear it. You put, you put your head to the chest like you could hear it crackling. And it gave me some tablets, said, crush this up. This was chloramphenicol. It said, crush this up in the drinking water. Well, I said, I can't crush it up in this drinking water. They don't drink like that. I can't give a measured dose. You might have a sip, you might not. You've got to give it orally or something like that. I said, but I don't want to give it chloramphenicol. I said, well, that's what we give all the chickens that, that come in, you know, when we go to the farm. I said, chickens are a different thing. Birds of prey, it's toxic to them. So that was your problem. So I ended up doing most of my um, veterinary work myself in, in the first, first 20 years. And most of them seemed to survive. The Lana Falcon unfortunately died. She got to what they call serotis spiculum, it's a kind of lungworm which infests the chest, uh, it forms a, a disc on, on the lung and then the worm comes from out of that disc and it goes through all the low, all the uh, bronchioles in, in the lung and eventually it kills the bird and they just lose weight, lose weight. The best thing to do is just euthanize it, which you, at the moment, you, 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 I don't think there's a cure for it even now. But this was the problem with importing birds from abroad. And I wish I'd been into photography then because some of the parasites that came in were probably new to science because bearing in mind, these things were coming from all the four, four corners of the globe. And unfortunately, I wasn't into photography, so um, that was that. So it's a, a good opportunity lost, and I've regretted that ever since. Do you have to travel far today, David, to get to a good avian vet? Um, yes, I do really. Um, 
these uh, West, Western referrals is the nearest one to me now down Gloucestershire way. I use a local one if I, if I need, if, I, if, it, if it, heaven forbid, if you broke a leg, that wouldn't be too big a problem because they can find out the uh, anaesthetic, because anaesthetic for a problem with birds of prey a long time ago. But setting a, a leg, any vet should be able to do that after, after an x-ray. But something like the, uh, the long worm and, and things like that, various internal parasites needs special knowledge. And I, I wouldn't entrust that to a, a non-avian vet. And when you're in the field with Star, how can you tell when she is starting to get stressed and so you're able to preempt that and foot her? Yeah, well, if he, if he, if he goes tight feathered, it goes attenuated like that, I know there's something bothering him. Put the hood on, have a look around, see what it is. That's something I may have missed. He took your feathers out here, you. Something I may have missed. Um, and so that's where the hood comes in. You know, it instantly calms him. And we find out if there's a problem. If not, then um, I won't fly him that day because if he's, if he's not right, that, that's telling me he's not wanting to go. And I made this mistake many years ago with the gospel when I was flying with the East Midland Talking Club. And I wasn't going to, going to fly him at all um, because I know, I know she wasn't really right. But I showed her, showed her a dead rat, and it was like that, really keen. So I thought, oh, okay, fair enough. So I slipped her up, slipped her at a rabbit. She went over the rabbit, up into the trees in the nearest wood. Never seen her since. So that was a hard lesson learned. I spent hours and hours and hours in that pine forest. I came back, and I'd been given a lift there in the car, and I was about 10 miles away from home. So I had to walk all the way back home because it all left. So that taught me to go and take some driving lessons. Yeah, I, I need to apologise to Star. I've just called him a female. Sorry. Star. Uh, he's a, he, uh, he's the, the only male gold league I've had. I've had several females, but he's the only male. Uh, I'm getting to my age now, John. I'm, I'm, I want to carry a lighter bird. The females are always bigger and heavier, as you probably know. Yeah, it's something that I do actually find fascinating. And who knows, maybe in the future, um, we can spend some time together in the field because it's something I'd, yeah. love to, I'd love to learn more about eagle falconry, that is. Um, yeah. Speaking of which, um, David, what is the contribution, please, of eagle falconers to eagle conservation? Quite a lot. You remember the White-tailed Eagle reintroduction project up in, yeah. up on, uh, in Scotland, on Rome and elsewhere? Uh, falconers' techniques were involved. All the eagles were wearing hoods, um, got, from, got from falconers. And this is where falconry always gets decried by certain organisations. Because there isn't um, a raptor uh, reintroduction problem or anything like that in the world anywhere where falconers have not been involved. Like for the, the program on the Eastern Seaboard of North America, for example, that was all down to falcons, all of it, uh, after the, um, the pesticide crash in the 60s. Um, same with the red kites. All these things have been kept in the falconry procedures, um, using falconers and falconers' knowledge. And there was a, a chap called um, Lendrum. He, he stole some peregrine eggs from Scotland, got us all about the name, was arrested at the airport, the eggs were confiscated, and they were passed on to a falconer friend of mine. Who reared them in his incubators and they, they took them out into, into the wild and, and put them into nests across fostered them into other, other nests. We never got a mention for that. You know, uh, and this, this is annoying. Um, all we're seeing now is a bloodthirsty hunters. It's got nothing to do. Well, it has got a lot to do with kill. We are hunters, it, uh, it's no getting away from that. But it doesn't matter whether we catch anything or not. It's these days it's more quality of flight. There are some some folks I know who, who, who the size of the bag is the most important thing at all. It's never been that for me. I want to go out, if I get one, that's it, I finish, that's me for the day. He's done his job, that's all I want to do. But it's like, um, how often can a bird watcher watch this beautiful bird doing what it does naturally, chasing after something in the wild and catching it? David Atman shows it all the time on, uh, on, his, on his animal programmes. When people write in and say, oh, it's, it's disgusting, he's killing an antelope. Uh, I did a lecture with, with an eagle once, and, and I gave it, um, this is in, in, in school with five and six-year-olds, and I gave her, gave her a, a whole white rat, she swallowed it whole. And the teacher took me to task on it. She was fuming, she took me outside. What, what are you doing, doing this? I said, well, I can't feed it cornflakes. We're trying to teach the kids, you know. So anyway, I got a week later, I got a parcel of, of letters from, from the children. And the two things they loved the most was when it swallowed the rat hole, when it did a whoopsie on the floor. That's children for you. Marvellous. Absolutely. David, um, 
Is there anything else that you'd like to add that I haven't asked about? I think you've covered most of it, as far as I can tell, yes. It's been absolutely fantastic talking to you, David, and I really appreciate the fact that you've brought Star on. Yeah, no problem. So, Dr. David Glyn Fox, Eagle Falconer, author, former lecturer, thank you very much for being on the Practical Animal Channel. My pleasure indeed, John. Thank you very much.